Uh, hi, everybody, and welcome. Uh, thank you all so much for being here tonight to celebrate Zara Stone and the launch of her just out today new book, Killer Looks, The Forgotten History of Plastic Surgery in Prisons. Uh, she's uh, in conversation tonight with the mighty Joe Loya, author of the critically acclaimed memoir, The Man Who Outgrew His Prison Cell, Confessions of a Bank Robber. My name is Evan Karp. I am the events manager for Booksmith. We're an independent bookstore and mainstay of San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury district since 1976. Uh, Joe Loya is an essayist, a TV writer, actor, and the author of the critically acclaimed memoir, The Man Who Outgrew His Prison Cell, Confessions of a Bank Robber. He was co-host of the podcast, The Score, Bank Robber Diaries. He recently founded Watcha Media, a production company, and is currently developing several podcasts, films, and TV shows in Hollywood. And Zara Stone is an award-winning journalist who covers the intersection of culture, technology, and social justice. She's published with The Atlantic, The Washington Post, Vice, Forbes, Wired, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Post, ABC News, The BBC, OZY Media, BuzzFeed, and has worked as an on-air reporter for Fusion, a nationally syndicated ABC News affiliate. She's part of the medium.com in-house network and her stories are regularly distributed to their 60 million monthly users. Stone's affiliations include the San Francisco Writers Grotto, the Authors Guild, and she's been a judge for the News and Documentary Emmy Awards for the last four years. Her awards include a Dow Jones Fellowship at the Wall Street Journal and a Mozilla Firefox Open News Grant. Um, thank you all so much for being here tonight and congratulations to you, Zara, on the new book. Um, thank you so much for being here. And Joe, thank you. Um, thank you so much for leading the conversation. Thank you, Evan, very much. Hi, Zara. How are you? Hey, doing good. <laughs> so I want to congratulate you on this book. I really love this book. And everybody, go get this book. I love it. I'm going to be pushing it uh, to all my friends because I really enjoyed reading it. It was a, it was a, real, it was a real treat. Um, I think my mind was engaged in so many things, not only the topic, which I found was so provocative and, and surprising. So I learned so much, despite the fact that I spent nine years in prison, I like didn't know, and I know a lot about um, you know, re-entry and stuff like that, other topics around here, but I had never, never heard of the, the decades and decades and decades of, of plastic surgery behind bars. It was so fascinating to learn that. And to think that you like, you know, you dug deep. It was very exciting. It was, it was a great read. I'm just really happy for it. And everybody, um, we're going to talk. We're going to have a great time. Um, ask some questions. We want to. We want to answer any questions you have um, that we bring up or any you have apart from that. Um, I just want to say before I was asked to do this with you, there was a lot of buzz around this book, and I would see it. And I was like, oh man, I can't wait for this book to come out. I can't wait to get my you know my hands on this book. Um, because there's this interesting that ha thing that happened when I first went to prison and in, in the feds. I walked into my tier, and uh, you know I had to I had to I walked into the prison tier, and you know I was prepared. I already had done two years in the state, and I was looking at doing seven in federal custody. So I walked in the tier. I go and put my stuff away. Um, I come out and now I'm looking just like for other Mexican guys to just kind of hey tell me what's what. How do we do things here? And I saw this really super handsome guy walking. And I, for sure, I thought he was staff. It was really bizarre how my brain clocked beauty and thought he can't be a prisoner. And there was a doubleness because he was wearing prison clothing, but he was so, he was beautiful. He was a beautiful human. And I thought he can't be us. He I can't be in my mind. And so like, I went back to my side, I remember, and this guy had a really terrible stutter. He was a fantastic painter. He had done he, the, the uh, prison warden had let him have, um, like um, paints that weren't allowed ever now because he was such a fantastic painter and he was doing all day anyway that they were letting him make these amazing gigantic paintings for for prison staff um he was a really remarkable painter but i remember being in my cell thinking why did i think beauty has such currency that it would have kind of inoculated him for being a criminal i did i didn't i didn't understand that and then i met another guy later on who he was he was a um Irish Westie, the newspapers when he was arrested referred to him as like a, a dark haired Jimmy Cagney. He was really considered even on the streets in the New York papers as being really handsome. And I remember looking at him like the same thing, like, what the fuck are you doing here? Why are you here? Why didn't it, your beauty protect you? You know? And he had he had one arm shorter than the other. So he had a he actually had a deformity. I say all that to say 
when your book came out and it was about plastic surgery and it was about the, um, the way they thought that plastic and the beauty could, you know, um, help you look at yourself differently and come out and stay out because you would feel less other, you would feel your otherness less potently. I remember those things, those ideas I had when I first went in that, yeah, I did believe once upon a time that beauty could keep you, should be able to keep you out of prison. What do you think about that? I mean, I think it's understandable, really, right? I mean, not just in prison, but we like live in a society that really venerates appearance, right? Like, you know, we have our celebrities, we have the movies, we just have this idea that, you know, beauty and morality are kind of somewhat interlinked. And it's, you know, in some ways it goes back to the whole like Disney idea, right? You know, the beautiful princesses, you know, the pale skin, all these kinds of signifiers, you know, which historically have connoted beauty. Also, you know, suggest racism and kind of history of that at the same time. But we have this like this long historical culture, which just says, you know, beautiful people, they get good things, they're worthy. And people have really taken this to heart. I mean, we've all seen a recent study, right? About like Facebook head on Instagram, how, you know, kids, what, like 40% of kids have like really poor mental health after like comparing themselves to other people. And it's just this idea that your presentation is so tied up with your own idea of self-worth, both internally and from external validation. Yeah, you know, your book is, makes an interesting point that that idea is ancient, actually. It goes, biblical, it goes biblical because, you know, not only do we find out, you know, about Absalom, you're so perfect and beautiful and all these other things about perfect, beautiful people, but even like you weren't allowed to go in the temple if you were ugly, basically, you know, like there was, there was like the Bible, you know, the, the Bible backs it up, but also, you know, even like Renaissance painters and stuff, they, they considered, um, I, I don't know, like beauty, ug ugly was like it connotes evil. And, and the things that were considered bad, like being left-handed or having red hair, they gave that to Judas, who was this guy who was, you know, despicable and just to be despised. And, um, <clears throat> and you know, we have Quasimodo, we have, you know, literature and on and on. Yeah. The books were really smart about going back and, and, and explaining how this beauty concept is, is, is like you said, it's a very current, it's very real now, but it, it really has its ancient its ancient place in, in, in um, uh, affecting our imagination about beauty and evil and, and the connection between those two. Um, yeah. yeah, go on, what were you going to say? Oh, I was, yeah, I was going to say, no, absolutely. I mean, that kind of connection, right, it even goes back to childhood. I mean, there's, there's all these studies about, you know, babies who are like a couple days old and how their eyes track the most attractive person in the room. And in school, right, you get, you know, the kids who are troubled are the less attractive ones. The kids who are spirited are more attractive. And, you know, from this young, we're already dividing people up into kind of good and bad, beautiful and less attractive. And like this kind of is seeded through our whole culture in terms of how we relate to people. <clears throat> when I thought when I read your book, I thought I was going to just go read, you know, simply the history of the, the medical procedures of plastic surgery or cosmetic surgery. Um, I didn't, you know, I really didn't get where we get plastic surgery as opposed to cosmetic surgery. Why was it plastic? How do we, when, did, I, did, I, did I miss that? Did you get into that? Why was it called plastic surgery as opposed, like, where's the plastic come from is what I wonder. Oh, well, I mean, I think that's from the Latin, uh, plasticos. Um, and I really don't really remember my university Latin very well. My dad used to do my homework. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you know, he, he loved it. He did it with his friends and I always got A's. It was great. Um, so, I, I, yeah, it has its roots in that. And the idea of, you know, pl in terms of plastic and being able to mold stuff, right? And, you know, seeing the body as something, you know, that's can, that can be molded rather than kind of, you know, set in stone. Like plasticity, I get it. Yeah, okay. Um, I do remember that when, um, when I was in prison, I did, I did know, I did think about this one thing where, um, you we read in here about how Dillinger and be, people were afraid that if you if you if you give plastic surgery to people who are um, who are disfigured and you know and we're talking serious disfigures we're talking about cleft palate we're talking about noses bashed in to really you know ears completely you know almost almost off or nose part you know it's like deformity kind of things. Um, uh, I, 
people were afraid that if we altered their appearance, then they would, if we altered a criminal's appearance, he would go out and with this new disguise, go and commit crimes. And then talked about how Dillinger had tried to do that. I, I just this year learned that Dillinger got rid of his dimples. I had like, well, I had these dimples. I'm like, Man, I'm not gonna get rid of these dimples even though they're considered a deformity. But he got his dimples taken care of. I, I, he changed his chin. Um, and I was re remembering how he tried, you know, he tried to make him, he changed his appearance and it reminded me of John Gotti when he was in um, prison. I remember this inmate who used to go give, um, prepare, give John stuff before he went to court. He was like the tear runner. And John, and John Gotti would actually get a brush, a hard bristle brush, and he would brush his face before he went to court because he didn't want to be pretty. He didn't want to be attractive. He wanted to have a tough, ugly look. So he, because he equated it with like, it was scarier. It was more menacing to be like, to like not be soft and pretty. Um, and I figured, and I thought about that when I, the, the Dillinger thing, um, but it was the, the, the interesting point I wanted to make was that people were afraid that, uh, that people were going to use it for, for nefarious reasons, not just to stay out and get a job and be well, mm -hmm. but people didn't really do, they, they, that wasn't really what it was. They were able also to, to test people out and see why they wanted to do it. And what, what were the reasons and the, you know, and the studies and the preparation for it, they were able to, to, to make sure that people who were doing it were not doing it because they wanted to better their criminal life. Yeah, and uh, well, I mean, it's, it's kind of complex, right? Because, you know, over half a million people had these surgeries and they stemmed, you know, from the ones kind of more on the plastic side, you know, like a cleft palate to more on the cosmetic side, you know, like a facelift and eye bag removal and cosmetic and plastic are often used pretty interchangeably. And so, it, you know, it was the idea was they were worried about people doing a Dillinger and most people in these programs really didn't. But the fears were very valid. There were a lot of people, offenders at the time, um, who had used plastic surgery to go on the run. Like the stories from every year, you see this in you know all the movies, like Humphrey Bogart, all of this. So you're getting all this media fed to you about you know criminals in disguise, and then you are also getting stories of I think there was the Powder Puff Bandit. They had amazing names for, for people back then, and you know these aren't people who went through these prison plastic surgery programs. These are people who, you know, offended on the outside and then got plastic surgery to stay disguised. So I th I think you know there were some worries about people misusing it that way, and. In terms of all these plastic surgeries that were, you know, done the official way, in a couple of cases, um, people <laughs> actually like did use it again for kind of criminal means, but in a really interesting way. So you'd have somebody who, for example, I don't know, they get a chin implant, they feel kind of more attractive and confident. Um, sometimes they found that people would go on to commit higher quality levels of crime. Ah, uh, great. Yeah, maybe they had, you know, just been, I don't know, stealing candy bars and now they were doing like wire fraud. So it was still, you know, technically an improvement, just not in the, but these were kind of cases where, you know, the minority. Technically an improvement. They got the chin improvement and then they got the upgrade to their criminal pedigree. That's interesting. That's funny. Uh, but it wasn't much. I mean, it was, and there was seemed like there was more hysteria about it than the actual factuality of it. Like you said, there were, there were many movies in which it was actually a great, plot device somebody gets out i mean even when i was growing up i remember this movie where somebody had a um an accident um a woman had an accident and she had been considered homely and then she was able to get her face refigured and she became beautiful and um she went and took revenge on everybody who treated her bad like the idea that changing your face allows you access to your criminality now um was it is was a you know was this is a scary thing um, I was going to ask you something else about, oh yeah, I actually met one person who had plastic surgery at, when they, es they escaped the prison and on the run, they had plastic surgery. And I remember he came onto the prison chair. I was in the hole at Lewisburg in, 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 um, in Pennsylvania. And the guy who was usually the tear runner, you know, we could only, our us inmates in this, in the basement, we were, all, were kind of serious criminals. So um, we, were, we were never allowed to be on the tier with other, other prisoners, but somebody needed to sweep up the tier and do that kind of thing. And I remember this guy was once, um, our tier runner was, was off to court. So I volunteered to be out there. And they had brought this new guy in. 
he's in his cell and he says, hey, 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 chair runner. I come over to him I look at his face and I remember being baffled because his name was like, I knew his name was like whatever, Ken Franklin or something like that. But the dude looked like Charlie Chan in the old movies, which was a white guy playing an Asian guy. Like he looked like makeup, like he was like he had he had had it. And what had happened was he had got busted right before he was finished, like with the second he was trying to change his looks to become to, to make himself look Asian. And so now they had busted him and now he has this look. And he, and I, it ended up, you know, he told me what had happened, why his look, because he saw me looking at him and he explained that that's what he had done. And um, this book reminded me of that character, but he hadn't gotten the surgery in. It's like you said, he had been outside hoping that he could change his look like, like Dillinger, but with no, like Dillinger had no luck. <laughs> got arrested. And when, when, so I'm reading this book and I'm thinking, there's this a lot of, a lot of, one, this, the way you did it with following Michael Lewin and then, and also, you know, following him through the book and, and the things he was discovering in him as a, a, a real organizing principle for the book to follow that story and then, and, and do all these other stories around the country around him. How did you come to that? Because there's so many stories and such a big story. And how did you determine the, 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 the organizing principle of the book? I mean, it was, it was very hard to figure out the structure because I'm trying to kind of plan out the book at the same time as, you know, I'm trying to get more sources and get into archives and like have to actually start writing the thing. And I was really torn actually between kind of having um, Douglas Lipton or Michael Lewin as the main character. I mean, they're both pretty main characters. Michael Lewin is the plastic surgery who, plastic surgeon who ran the experiment on Rikers Island. And Douglas Lipton is, you know, the kind of sociologist who kind of, you know, also ran it on Rikers Island, but he was pretty junior at the time. I think he was like 27 years old. So you had this kind of like 55 year old surgeon and this 27 year old upstart. So I thought it was really interesting kind of having them pair off against each other. But having uh, Michael Lewin kind of be the driving force of the narrative really allowed me to go into kind of his own background. Because Michael Lewin, right, he was an immigrant. He had come from Poland. His, you know, his parents all died in the war and they'd been in a ghetto. And so he had this really instinctive sense of what it felt like to be different. And, and I mean, I think you would consider him yeah. an attractive man, right? But he had an accent. He was poor. He's in New York City, which is like glitz and glam. But if it's the 1930s and you're broke, you're not really seeing any of that. So this is kind of his deep well of sympathy for people who were othered and also understanding how their appearance played a role. And, and you know, he was a plastic surgeon, so he thought about looks and he could see the benefits and he could see how it changed people's like psyche, how you, know, you operate on somebody and then how it really does free them up and give them the opportunity to kind of carve their own life for themselves. Um. So I love the other character I thought was really important in this and, and a dominant character is Anna Cross, Judge Anna Cross. Um, but I was, I was impressed by the, like, you know, as, as, a, as a writer and I was reading this book and I was getting, I was enjoying the hell out of it. And then I realized, oh shit, she had to do a lot of work to get it to read so smoothly because there are so many moving parts. There's so many different elements. It's not just plastic surgery. Basically we are studying is um, parole reentry um, um, recidivism, you know, the ranchy slash recidivism. Um, and so I was, I was like, what a daunting task. And you were so thorough in the research. There's a 40, 40 page bibliography at the end. It's like, you did the research and it tells, but the, the good thing is, it's like, I, I think I mentioned earlier to you, it's one of these books, these rare books where it's so researched, but the narrative is so strong. It, it, none of the research feels like it's a speed bump along the way. It's all embedded in the narrative and the narrative just goes. Um, and I thought it was really, I'm not gonna give it away, but the opening story um, about um, a kid who comes to the, a baby who comes to the hospital and then and develops complications um, was so powerful. And like, it's just, I saw this almost cinematically like, oh, 
you, I, I could see the story of this doctor who confronts this issue and then he's he's driven off and he has this guy who comes along with him and they're following it and then they got this woman judge and they're all doing this thing through the decades and the deck and they're fighting and the, the different pressures on the poise of, of the, the different trends and how to deal with criminals from the eugenics on and on it was it's it's such a captivating read um but I did feel like a it was it was the one of the smartest books I've read on parole and reentry without being on parole and reentry being on the, on the cover. You know, it really was, it was really smartly well, an exploration of that as well, because that's ultimately what plastic surgeons, these plastic surgeons were concerned about. They wanted to know how effective is this at that? And it seemed, it seemed like we really, in the end, don't, didn't know, like, I mean, it seemed pretty effective in a lot of the studies, but you know, all of the studies that were had flaws. So it's kind of difficult to think about that because you know we're using the measures that we have today, and we look at the studies then. But they, you know, they were like seven or eight, like really large scale studies. Uh, one from Canada that spanned twenty years, where you know they followed people up afterwards. They followed up five years, ten years. They wanted to see if they, you know, reoffended, what their lives were like. And so we did, we did have that kind of sense that, you know, the recidivism rate, I think right now is around 72%, right? So it's something like, what is it? Like every 72% like of people like will go back to prison within five years. And it was pretty similar then. And in a lot of these studies, it kind of dropped it to 30%, which was very significant. And I mean, there's mitigating factors, which was interesting, right? Like you know, some of the studies, they had control groups where they were like, we'll follow people who have it, people who don't have it, people who get just extra welfare benefits. And so th there was a concerted effort to have a better understanding. But, you know, the, the studies were really just the side part of it. The overarching theme was we want to lower the recidivism rate. And like everything else people are trying isn't working. And like we have this idea, it might work, it might not, but we're going to like have a go. Yeah, I really I'm, I have so much to ask. Um, there was that one section in the book where, where obviously you know when they started it was it was men, and then somebody had the question of how come there's no women in these studies and everything. Like, oh yeah, how come there are no women? Like you know people were people who were giving the money to do these programs came in and people were caught off guard. Not they hadn't it's like they hadn't even thought about it. But when they went to it, I remember reading this part of the book, which fascinated me. They would ask women to join a woman, like almost fatalistic about it. Like, no, I don't know why. I'm just going to keep coming back. And I was wondering if you had any more information about that. I thought that in the middle of, there was a couple moments where I thought, oh, I'd love to read way more on this topic. Like, I'd love that unpacked because, uh, yeah, what did, what did you think about that? I mean, yeah, there, there is so much to unpack and there's so much I couldn't even fit into the book. I think there's a whole chapter about San Quentin I had to cut in the end. But, uh, you know, I think about the women in the surgery. I mean, so something like around 90% of the programs, right, um, really were for men, maybe even more. But at the same time, like 90% of, you know, prisoners are men. Like, I mean, the female prison population has significantly grown but it's still you know, nowhere compared to the men. So all the resources went into men's prisons. I mean, and that's a separate problem, right? Like, you know, incarcerated women have like really terrible education and really terrible services today and then compared to men. So some of the women in prison, um, I think this is a Rikers Island study um, at the Women's House of Correction, they were pretty fatalistic about the idea. But it was also because it hadn't really been rolled out there. And the idea of free plastic surgery, especially if you're incarcerated, people are like, you know, well, what's the hook? Like, what's the catch? Like, you know, the prison service doesn't traditionally kind of give inmates something that benefits them in this way. So and I the think- medical care regularly, yeah. And women and the medical field, especially um, female inmates who, you know, there's a lot of historic abuses. And at the Women's um, House of Correction, I think the one for Rikers Island one, that had been um, a bunch of really terrible stuff had gone down there. And like, they're really in about the same period that time had gone on. And so I think, you know, their reluctance and their nerves about it were pretty understandable. Yeah, what did surprise you when you were, when you were, when you were researching it? What, what 
you know, I'm sure it's all, like all fascinating, interesting, or whatever. But what was there anything that more than many other any other fact was surprising to you or startling or? So yeah. one thing, yeah. Um, well, one of the things that I guess stood out was how racist some of these programs were, but racist um, in an unexpected way. Um, so, I mean, I've reported on plastic surgery before and, you know, a lot of times, you know, there's, there's this idea that, you know, people want to be white and they want to de-racialize their features because they want to have this Caucasian benefit. And so I thought, you know, potentially when I hadn't, didn't know that much about this at the time, I was like, oh, are they going to like, are you going to have like a lot of white doctors trying to get like black people to look white? So to fix them or whatever. Right. Like, and I, I thought maybe that would be the case, but actually <laughs> Um, I, can't, I can't remember the exact numbers, but I would say generally it was like 70% of people who got these were white. And to some extent, that's because, you know, they, they were, these surgeries were considered so valuable, really. Um, the, the idea of, you know, prettier people, they get paid better, they get better perks in life, that they weren't necessarily offered to the um, incarcerated black people. So they had less, they had, so they were being racist to them by not giving them the surgeries. And yeah, that like took a little while to kind of get my head around that. That's interesting. So you wrote about plastic surgery before you came to this. So that's, how did it, where was the angle where you're like, okay, Randall, plastic, like prison plastic surgery? Like, well, how did that, how did that come into your purview? I mean, I mean, I've covered kind of plastic surgery and identity and represent, representation for a while. And I've also kind of written about social justice. And I think I've done a story about like coding programs in prison and something like that. And so I never really intended this to be a book. Initially, I was like, oh, this will be a really big article. And then I just kept getting more and more information and it ballooned. And I was like, oh, I, I think I have a book on my hands here. No, yeah, you do. Is, is there a second book on this one? Because I was wondering about that. Um, but I mean, yeah, you left out stuff. You Like you said, you left out the San Quentin piece. What other kind of stuff do, did you have to leave out? That, that would just... I mean, it's, it's hard to say. It's just because, you know, of kind of keeping it to a narrative. And when you talk about kind of appearance bias, it can get so broad. And I mean, I think, think I went in a little bit about, you know, the legal protections for appearance of which, you know, there aren't really any, I think Santa Cruz has an ordinance that kind of protects you about weight and that kind of stuff. But I think even there, like people who sue, they don't really get any compensation. And so it's just having to like having this broad thing and having to drill it down. Like there was some fabulous thing about this woman, um, Jessie Bahagan. She was, um, I think, New York, one of the first police commissioners, and she was a black lady. And for years she wanted to, you know, take the police surgeon exam. And they're like, oh, women aren't allowed. And she sued and she won. They appealed. She sued and she like, it took her five years of winning three lawsuits before she was allowed to take this exam. And when like she took it, the papers were all like pretty policewoman and like, you know, horrible sexist stuff. And like she battled through this and she went on and she forged this career and I couldn't fit any of that in there. So it's just- Yeah, yeah no, exactly, yeah. Um, but I love what you, you know, fortunately we have um, amazing stories following these people and we do get, we do get into the lives. I feel like the judge Anna Cross is a great character. Like even like just see her trajectory, see the things she grappled with, see, I mean, she had this great line. I think she was the one, you know, she, I, I really liked her because her ideas about you know, education is important, and you know what she what she thought was important back in the '60s and the '70s. To 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 me today, all the people I know who are doing work consider the things we need to pay attention to. She was paying attention back then, but she had this line, something like, "Oh, I, I wonder if I have it here even," where she said something like, "Like when she became when she became the commissioner or whatever, what did she become?" She uh, corrections commissioner of New York City. No, it's going to take women to stop crime or something like that. You know, like she felt like the men have been doing it and they've been failing. Like, and, and that's the other thing about this book. That's what I was telling you is about parole and, and reentry and recidivism and recidivism. I felt like this was a really good history of like from 1910 to, you know, 19, the 19, early 1990s, a really good example of all the ways all the congressional acts, all the ways, all the people intervening to try to stop crime, you know, stop, deal with the problem of crime. Like they're just failing, 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 failing. I don't want to sound like no reentry programs work, but the the way people gave up on things too early, 
the way people, you know, the, the changing climate, the trends, um, it was it was really a good history of that as well to see the players fighting fighting in the trenches to try to to get people to be more compassionate with these rural people the, the the you know the people behind bars to give them medical care to treat them humanely to give them education to give them better living conditions like it was just a fight all the way and and also in here to help them you know possibly change their look appearance so they can get out and get a job. It's very heartening and very lovely to hear these stories where it actually, you would, you know, you track some stories and people got out, they got their job, they wrote back, they got married. It was, you know, it was successful. I love that you put those in there along with people who <laughs> they weren't as, they weren't as successful. Um, when I got out of prison, one of the things I told people, it was very hard for me the first couple of years in my imagination to think that I could make it. I had a lot of privilege. I came out here. I had probably one of the softest landings of anyone I know. I had support. People wanted me to be a writer. And I would tell people if I had been, if I had had an addiction, it would have been. I don't think I could have made it. There's, you know, fortunately, I didn't have, um, I didn't have an addiction issue. Um, and I had friends who did, and they kept going back. So, so it was interesting to real to 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 see that these 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 people wanted to help um, these prisoners when it came to addicts. They had a, a more challenging time that they hadn't anticipated, which was a lot of them had a high tolerance to, to medication. So they would they would they would they would put them under during the during the um, procedure, and they would come out of it. They'd be screaming like, eh, "I need more, I need more!" And they hadn't um, they hadn't accounted for the fact that because they were drug addicts or because they were you know had, had used so much drug that they had a higher tolerance. I thought that was an interesting. I thought that was interesting how they went in there and it was, you know, sort of a, a metaphor. They went in there thinking that they were going to be helpful in some ways and in some ways they didn't know the population they were serving and they didn't know how, you know, some of the challenges that they were going to face. Yeah, I know. It was really hard. Um, I mean, because for Rikers Island, right? So they all had the surgeries after they left the jail. Um, so yeah, so Rikers Island's a jail, not a prison. But some of the people they treated, right, they might have stopped being, um, you know, gone off heroin. But then, then they sort of get addicted again because they have surgery, they have painkillers, they take opioids. And that was a consequence that the doctors really hadn't thought about or planned for. And, you know, they would be disruptive on the ward. And this wasn't a prison hospital now. These were public hospitals in New York. And, you know, they'd be getting extra drugs from the nurses and it would kind of become chaos. So, yeah, it's, I mean, it's hard to account for everything, right? We're doing the best I could. And addiction is this really horrible, difficult problem. I mean, you, you know, like nobody offends just for one reason, right? And making someone prettier doesn't solve their life. But, you know, upset if you're upset about your appearance and addiction, it's almost like that overshadows everything till you can get that under control. Yeah, I remember when I when I was getting out of prison and the um, I was going to college in prison at the end, and Pell Grants helped. And I remember there was a big uproar in the mid the early to mid '90s about getting rid of like why are you educating? We can't ed get college education ourselves. Why are you educating criminals? And it had been education is proven to to lower recidivism. I mean, of, of all the things you can give an inmate to like really give them a head start when they get out of not coming back. It's education, and and there was this tough on crime, you know, um, this attitude, and they took Pell grants away, and um, and it's funny that's how you ended the you ended it on that like as as the and and we you ended toward the the early mid nineties, that that was one of the things you mentioned like just the way people started thinking about helping prisoners was like, fuck you, we don't we don't want to give you anything that we can't have. And even if it solves a problem, and even if it saves us money in incarcerating you, we don't, we, you, if we can't have it, you can't have it. It was kind of, it was that kind of, kind of thing. Yeah. I, I mean, it's just, you know, the idea that the public just gets really, you know, upset and frantic about, you know, other people having privileged privileges they don't and you know really like a lot of term times crime is an economic issue right i mean not in all cases but people often will be low income and poverty will have all these you know contributing factors and 
in America, I say in America because I'm British, um, you know, you guys don't have health care, which is like a pretty, I mean, you know, in Britain there were still problems and there were still plastic surgery programs there. But, you know, the healthcare aspect of it is so essential and that kind of leads to so many issues. I mean, it also can lead to, you know, unattractiveness in terms of, I don't know, you you fall over, you get a scar on your face. If you're wealthier, you'll, ha you'll see a dermatologist, it'll go away. If you're broke, you might end up with a scar on your face for the rest of your life. And, you know, and that like people respond to somebody with a scar on their face a certain way. You respond to how they respond and it becomes this horrible, vicious cycle. And people really need to kind of grow their empathy and, you know, not just help people while they're in prison, help them from when they're young as well. Like this is a social problem. That's, and that's a big part of this book too, is thinking about it in terms of um, the, you know, trying to intervene early in juvenile so that the otherness tag doesn't stay, the labeling of the other, they're not feeling, not getting stuck in the labeling. I thought that was, that was a really good thing. I want to say one more thing that was at the middle of this fascinating book. Every, I'm telling you, this is, is so rich with stories, ideas, um, um, and it's, you know, it covers so much, like I said, it's, it's a fascinating, like, history of plastic surgery, and the idea that, you know, people were talking and doing it back in 1910 um, uh, on, and even they were doing it while I was in prison, um, but, but in a book of fascinating things, there was this one one piece right in the middle of it where they were talking about, oh, we're going to, we're going to get these guys. A bunch of guys want to do it. They've signed up for it. Now let's start interviewing them. And when they started interviewing them, they realized, oh, see, these guys just want to do it because they just want to be better bandits or whatever. These guys just want to do it for this reason or whatever. But they would come across this one group and it was, it was very touching. They, they would not give it to this one group of people who wanted it too badly. Mm -hmm. And they, the people who wanted it too badly, who they knew it would help, the reason they wouldn't give it to them was it was 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 sad, which was they really really wanted it, and they would be massively disappointed. You could give them Sean Connery looks, and they 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 would be so disappointed that it would end up being ineffective. And I thought that like, that's one of the things I want you to un like not you like 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 you didn't give it to us, but that's an idea. I thought the people who want something so badly that they're deprived of it. it almost feels like like beyond greek in a way like you you desire something too much and you can't have that he was just you, you know do you remember that point of the book well, I, I guess i guess my, i have a different perspective on it like i see that really as a mental health issue so body dysmorphia right the, the idea that you look in the mirror and you don't see yourself as you look and you have people historically who've had a lot of surgeries and they keep wanting more because they're not happy and you know, the doctors um, from this interview might not always have got it right, but I think the idea was, you know, people with, I don't even know if body dysmorphia was a term back then, I think they called it like too much focusing. Um, the idea that, you, you know, you, you pay too much attention to your appearance, surgery is just going to, you know, continue the problem and not be effective. So it, it is hard when somebody wants something really mu very much, but I mean, people want a lot of things that aren't good for them. And I, I see that really as just elaborating on that theme. I do, okay, I, maybe I didn't communicate that wrong. I do see it as body dysmorphia, which is such a fascinating topic to me. You know, like, it's like, it's like narcissist. His thing was he loved looking at himself so much, it stopped him from being able to go hunt. And you're like, you need to hunt, you need to eat, you know? So that's what I mean. Like it has this element of like, he was so, he desired his beauty so much, like he just got stuck in it and couldn't actually do the thing to survive that dysmorphia that it is this desire that you can't that's that like you said some mental health component it's just there's something really tragic about that but it was also just it was it was right there in the middle of it i was like oh it was so close but it's just no we're not gonna get sad um okay so listen uh do you mind if we open it up to some questions we have some questions. i know go for it all right let's see who we have here okay um I'm really curious about how you first found out about the whole issue of plastic surgery in prison. What launched you into this investigation? Uh, did we we kind of we kind of gone through that, or do you want to say a little more on that? Um, I could say I guess I could say a little more. Um, so so I guess I found out about this. I was researching um plastic surgery on pets, 
uh, cause I was doing a, a history piece and it turns out in the French revolution, you know, when the, I think the commoners, you know, they, they, you know, they rose up and they killed all like, you know, the wealthy and the monarchy, um, they started killing their animals as well because, you know, these animals were often fed better than they were, you know, slept in silk baskets and had all these things. And, you know, it was an uprising and they were hurting. So a lot of the privileged people at the time would, you know, give their animals plastic surgery. So like, you know, dogs, they would have the tails cut a certain way or their noses. I, this is still on my to write list, by the way. So claiming it here. Um, and while I was researching that, I just sort of came across a couple of mentions of this prison plastic surgery, which I had never really heard of before. And I was so surprised because this is a field I feel that I'm pretty well versed in, but I just went really deep and, you know, a little bit obsessive. That's good. That's good. Um, but I'd also love to hear about how you researched the book. Oh, that was Ka um, Kathy Seligman who, who um, asked the first question. This is, this is Katya Savchuk, I guess. Savchuk. Uh, would also love to hear about how you researched the book. Was it hard to get access to records? Oh, it was really hard, actually. I mean, so a lot of these records, right, are medical, they're historical. Um, so, you know, the first problem is, you know, HIPAA, what can I see, what can't I see? And there's all these rules that maybe you can see it if, like, it's been 100 years since them or they're dead, all this stuff. Um, then there's the fact that, you know, the archives don't necessarily keep all these records. So a lot of stuff gets dumped, it doesn't get maintained, and that's really difficult. Um, then COVID, which was just, you know, brilliant for the research thing. So that just kind of added to the pickle. And then the fact that I wanted to speak to people who'd been involved. And, you know, a lot of um, people who've been incarcerated tragically have sh often have shorter lifespans due to, you know, multiple things. And so it was harder to find people like that that I could speak to. I managed to track down a bunch of surgeons uh, and, and sociologists and psychologists, and that was fabulous. And, you know, a lot of them have like amazing, like photographic memories. Maybe it's because of the work they did. So that was this great trove of treasure. But then it was just, yeah, going through libraries, like scanning archival books, having, learning to use this, like, what is it? Like microfilm scanner. Um, yeah, it was a lot of reading and researching and records. Um, did any of the recipients of surgery regret it? This is Karen Rule. Um, in general, uh, they were pretty, pretty low on the regret scale. I think there was, I think there's one story of um, one uh, black inmate and he actually had kind of, um, he got like no surgery, I think to make it a little bit, look a, the, look a little bit more white. And then apparently he regretted it, did it and his family complained. But <clears throat> there really weren't too many reports of people being unhappy. Uh, one thing they actually, I, I just lied, that's not true. One thing that everybody was actually pretty unhappy about was often tattoo removal. So, um, you know, back then, um, one, of, one of the common ways of doing it was essentially to just remove a giant strip of skin. And you would be left with a, you know, a really ugly scar but you wouldn't have a Nazi tattoo or something like that. So the payoff was for some people considered better but the issue was that around this time, they also started having laser tattoo removal. But this wasn't offered to the, um, the inmates because it was considered they wouldn't be reliable enough to come for all the sessions. So tattoo removal had a lot of complaints about it and people were very, were actually pretty unhappy. Yeah. Um, Jesus Sierra says, can any prisoner ask for elective plastic surgery versus necessary plastic surgery? I don't think they're, they're allowing plastic surgery anymore, right? Or I mean, I mean, today, the only plastic surgery that happens in prisons is strictly um, medical. And, you know, often then it's really hotly debated. I mean, trans surgery, you know, is, isn't plastic surgery. That's a medical need. Um, no prisons really right now can request anything for any cosmetic purposes. And Bureau of Prisons and pretty much every prison which publishes a guideline, they have clauses written in there about, you know, which explicitly rule out like cosmetic dental work, like cosmetic appearance. Some of them have caveats that with approval of the warden, we can give them something for their attractiveness. But I did a bunch of foyers. Um, I think one, one of my most recent foyers was in Texas and nothing had been improved in like 30 years. Yeah. Ethel Rohan, do you know Ethel? Yeah. Hey Ethel, how you doing? Uh, what about the trainee surgeons who perform these procedures and surgeries? I imagine institutions use a prison system as training ground 
for rookies and experiments, et cetera. Yeah, there's a lot of that in the book where you talk uh, about. Yeah, there, there is that in the book, but overall, when you look at all the like the different prison programs, um, and I think they were in about maybe 44 states plus federal plus DC, um, only 25% of those were explicitly like training schools for plastic surgeons. And, you know, I'm sure the junior plastic surgeons didn't always get it right, but 75% of the other ones were not trainees and were not being run, you know, in conjunction with the university, were kind of done a lot more altruistically. Yeah. Were there any surgical complications that caused serious illness or death? I mean, that there weren't really any surgical complications in that way. The stuff they were doing wouldn't really I mean, it sounds scary when you talk about like remaking your nose and cutting away eye bags, but you know, from a plastic surgeon's level, this is stuff that's like pretty hard to mess up. Like maybe it won't be the greatest nose ever, but like bone going into your brain is pretty unlikely. I mean, there were some complications in the early days. There's stories at San Quentin in like the 1927, that kind of era where um, you would have, um, well, actually the techniques they used were dreadful. So they would like knock somebody out and then the surgeon would have like four people hold him down and he would take a broom handle and put it against his nose and like whack it. And then the nose would straighten that way. And sometimes he'd wake and like rear up and they'd have to push him down. So I, th I think some kind of mental trauma, but in terms of death, nothing like that i mean then you get into kind of prisoner experimentation which was a real thing and a problem. Yeah, that is, yeah but that wasn't this was kind of running separate to these programs i mean so like at holmesburg prison in pennsylvania they had you know like the retin a trials like retin a you know the thing we use today to get rid of acne um there they would apply it at like 10x amounts to people and it would strip the skin off their body but that was that was kind of done in the that wasn't a plastic surgery procedure and kind of run under those auspices that was run under somebody who was you know like being paid by Pfizer or MERS and really you know not using his situation to benefit the inmates. And there was man, your book does talk about the um, some you know obviously some of the things the government did medical testing on prisoners that were or not even prisoners some of the soldiers or Tuskegee soldiers and. There was a lot of stuff that was really terrible that after Attica, I think, I believe people started looking at the way people were, had been treated. And, and also, if I'm not mistaken, in the book, it talks about how the ACLU felt like, listen, they might be doing some good, but how, how, um, how much are prisoners, how much agency do they really have when you say, listen, well, you will be considered for a lesser sentence if you get the surgery, like how, how, like it almost feels like coercion when you're locked down and they're saying, hey, you might, you, it, it might shave time off your thing if you do this. There was an idea that maybe it wasn't as altruistic as it felt at the beginning of it because of the, con, you know, the condition of confinement when men were confronted with this. I mean, I, I think it's a really good question, right? I mean, I don't, you know, what, well, like, can somebody consent while incarcerated? Like, what does that even mean? Like, is it ethical to offer something when the consent is, you know, might come with strings attached? And I mean, I think, I don't think everybody was explicitly had the surgery, you know, we'll get a lower prison sentence, but there were a bunch of cases where people, the surgery would be mentioned in their parole hearings and, yeah. you know, was considered kind of high value enough that, you're, you know, you're incarcerated and you, you being offered this thing and the consent issue is a problem. I mean, the Rikers Island study, they kind of figured that out because nobody received surgery till they were released. Um, but in all the other prisons, yeah, I think that was a problem. And I think, you know, there's some stories of, I think this was Pennsylvania again, right? Where um, some of the trainee surgeons, they like really wanted to do like X operation. So they might offer people like more opioids if you do this. And that was very problematic. So I think the, the fact that they're not available in prisons anymore is a good thing. I think it should be more accessible yeah. to people when they leave prisons and people in general. Yeah, 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 good. Um, that was Marsha Biederman. Um, so Margie Woodring, given the surprising success rate, would you advocate for this program to be introduced if it could be done so with standards to prevent racial bias in its application? I think we're saying no. It's good that it's not. I, I don't think it should be offered right. in prison. I mean, I think the stuff that you could do um, in the plastic surgery space, 
I mean, somebody more more along the disfigured space. So somebody, right, who they want like a prettier nose, like, no, like, can you really consent to that? Somebody who, I don't know, has something very obvious that needs fixing. Um, I don't know, like their nose is bent all the way here. I think that's the kind of thing that they could be more flexible on, you know, the same way yeah. that, I mean, I mean, I think what was in Texas, right? I feel like teeth, there was like some horrible thing where like teeth were not considered essential. So you had like people who like never got any dentures because apparently like chewing was not necessary. I don't know, I can't remember the quote, but just, you know, this really inhumane way of othering people is just something we need to get rid of. Uh, Juliet Jardim, uh, what was the most common surgery? I think you got into that. I forget what it was. Uh, nose jobs. Nose jobs. Yeah, that was it. And and the other thing too is really cool. Is like there are photos in there. There's a good photos. There's a, a good array of photos in there. I, I enjoyed that. So you know, because you do, you're curious. You want to see the before and afters, right? That was good. Um, Anne Young asked, was parole likelihood of reintegration a factor? And who was eligible? I want to say one thing about this first. I thought it interesting. I thought it was interesting. You know that when I I had friends who went to prison, I mean who went to the military because they were told when they were acting up when they were young, you know, you have a choice, kid. You join the military, or I'm sending you to jail. And instead of doing that, like the diversion was 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 the military, right? Um, in this case, there was some cases where the judge would send people to prison so that they could get the plastic surgery, knowing that that was going to help them not re, you know, um, uh, not reoffend later. Do you, do you, do you, like, oh, yeah, I, no, it was just, yeah, I mean, I think as these programs rolled out, um, you know, people could, some people could see the benefits, but then <laughs> I think, you know, the guy sentenced, the judge sentenced this man to prison so he could have the surgery, and the plastic surgeon was like really upset about it. He was like, you could just have talked to me, you didn't need to send him to jail for this. And then I think there was a case of another guy who was going to be released and he asked for it to be deferred so he could finish his surgeries because, you know, he'd been on the waiting list for a while because generally these programs were heavily oversubscribed. Like there would, you know, there were always more people who wanted it than people who were available. I think, so for Rikers for Reich, Island study, you know, they when they first did it, they put out these like little cool boxes all around the jails and you would write your name on a slip and put it in there if you wanted something. And, you know, the surgeons and the sociologists running that were really worried that nobody would apply. They're like, oh, well, they think it's weird. And they got they got 9,200 applications their first time around. And so they were just like pulling strip after strip and probably regretting that they had made the boxes so big or something. Well, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to close it. I'm going to close it. Um, I really love, well, you know, obviously I'm, I was a super, super fan of this book. I can't, I can't wait to keep promoting it. Um, but there was just one thing I kept thinking throughout it was what, whatever we feel about plastic surgery in, you know, from 1910 to 1996 or whatever the book covers, whatever we feel about um, its of, of efficacy, whatever. One thing is these programs stayed despite a lot of pushback, even from within, like to get it done, like to have the guys in the prison. I know people who go in to conduct education um, and they have to wait because there's movement problems. They lot people are locked down. Some people can come to the programs. They can't. Some people are getting in trouble and they can't like to try to help people in the prisons is really challenging work, especially if you have guards who resent it and are like trying to, to thwart you all the way, or you have an administration even that's kind of against it, even though the, maybe the state has sanctioned it, there's all these things within, and then there's all this pressure from society, and then there's government. The fact that these people were going and going and making it happen and, and continually finding it, it was, it was really impressive. And um, you and you chronicled their story really well, and I thought that was what I really liked, where there's a heroic aspect of them struggling all through it from within and without. And I really enjoyed the story of, of these characters and, and the inmates and learning more about, you know, and, and I'm not like a guy who doesn't know about reentry, having gone through it and, you know, read about it and written about it. It was really, really well researched, uh, a story well told. Congratulations. I hope you have amazing success with this book. And 
Oh, it was great to be in this conversation. You have anything you want to say before we before we go talk to anybody, tell anybody anything? <laughs> um, I, I mean, thank you, Joe. Yeah, I'm just for making this so easy and for yeah, kind of sharing so much of your own story as well. Um, I really appreciate that, and it's yeah, just great to talk about this more because I think you know beauty bias is something nobody really talks about. It's uncomfortable. It's awkward. But if you know people don't recognize this privilege, then we're not really gonna have any answers or solve anything. No, there you go. All right. Well, thank you everybody for coming. Evan, you coming back in? I'm I'm trying to, but I seem to be a specter here. Uh, <laughs> hold on, I, I I I'm in the darkness. I'm outside, but um, may, maybe I'll I'll just be a disembodied voice. Um, I, I want to thank uh thank you both. You're both so wonderful. And um, uh, Zara, congratulations on the book. Uh, Joe, thank you so much for leading this conversation. It's truly been a delight and and fascinating. Uh, conversation. Everybody um, out there, thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you don't have the book yet, um, click through. The link is just beneath the video. Get it from Booksmith. Uh, uh, if you're not in the Bay Area, you know, get it from your local bookstore. Uh, that's okay. We, we will totally forgive you, encourage you even. Um, just get the book. Um, thank you all for joining us and uh, um, uh, take care and be well. I uh, hope to see you again soon. Um, good night, everyone. And congratulations again, Zara.